Hello, everybody. My name is Jennifer Egan, and on behalf of more than 7,000 writers, translators, editors, and literary allies who belong to PEN America, it is my delight to welcome you to the 15th annual PEN World Voices Festival of International Literature. Today's event is The Art of Violence, a conversation involving Rodrigo Ray Rosa, Mohammed Hanif, and Tommy Orange, moderated by novelist and military veteran Matt Gallagher, who will give you more information about the other guests in a moment. We present this program in cooperation with the Cooper Union, and we thank them hugely for their support. As the current president of PEN America, I want to take just a moment to say a word about our work. PEN America's vision is to foster literary culture and protect the liberties that make it possible, namely the freedom to write. Literature is the embodiment of empathy, subtlety, contradiction, and complex thought, qualities essential to a healthy democracy. It is no accident that autocrats go after writers and try to silence them, because what we're doing here right now is antithetical to the control of discourse and ultimately thought that is a basic tool of autocracy. Pan America works to ensure that people everywhere have the freedom to express themselves, to convey information and ideas, and to access the views, ideas, and literatures of others. And to that end, this festival was founded 15 years ago to feature and celebrate the global community of writers whose works and ideas sustain our cultural life. This is the last day of what has been a splendid festival week. There's one more event to go, and we would love to see all of you at the Apollo Theater to hear the legendary Arundhati Roy deliver the Arthur Miller Freedom to Write lecture. You can still get tickets at penworldvoices.org. Nice to know we have some young, member, young readers in the audience. Uh, finally, I would like to thank the sponsors, supporters, and especially the volunteers who make Penn World Voices Festival possible. Thank you all for coming today, and please enjoy the conversation. Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for being here on a rainy Sunday afternoon. Uh, my name is Matt Gallagher, um, and I'm the moderator of today's panel. Uh, ha happy Mother's Day uh, to all the moms out there. Um, uh, you know, everything is, is due to you. Um, I really did try to think of a grace graceful transition from that to the subject of today's panel. Um, if there's something out there, I wasn't able to, to muster it up. So we'll just, we'll just dive right into it, okay? Uh, you know, violence pervades uh, every aspect of modern life uh, in America and, and the world over as well. It's in the news, it's in the streets, uh, it's now in our school classrooms. Uh, we may indeed live in a world gone mad, to borrow a recurring phrase from panelist Rodrigo Ray Rosa's new book, Chaos, a Fable, uh, which makes the importance of writing about violence all the more fundamentally vital, while also as ethically challenging as it's ever been. Uh, perhaps there's no uh, collection of finer contemporary writers and thinkers than those we have today with us to help sort through all these dark complexities uh, of writing about violence with both forthrightness and care. Uh, so uh, without further ado, uh, I'm gonna introduce our three panelists. Uh, we're gonna start with three readings, or one reading by each of the panelists, uh, and then we'll uh, segue into a conversation. Our first panelist and reader is Mohammed Hanif. Mohammed was born in Akara, Pakistan. He graduated from the Pakistan Air Force Academy as a pilot officer, but subsequently left the military to pursue a career in journalism. His first novel, A Case of Exploding Mangoes, was long listed for the Man Booker Prize, shortlisted for the Guardian First Book Pro Award, and won the Commonwealth Writers Prize for Best First Novel. His second novel, Our Lady of Alice Bati, was shortlisted for the 2012 Welcome Book Prize. His third novel, Red Birds, was released last year to much critical acclaim. He's written the libretto for a new opera and writes regularly for the New York Times, BBC Urdu, and BBC Punjabi. He currently splits his time between Berlin and Karachi. Our second panelist and reader is Tommy Orange. Tommy is a recent graduate from the MFA program at the Institute of American Indian Arts. 
He's a 2014 McDowell Fellow and a 2016 Writing by Writers Fellow. He's an enrolled member of the Cheyenne and Arapaho tribes of Oklahoma. He was born and raised in Oakland, California, and currently lives in Angels Camp, California. His debut novel, There There, won the 2019 Penn Hemingway Award, the National Book Critics Circles Award John Leonard Prize, and was a finalist for the 2019 Pulitzer Prize for Fiction. Our third panelist and reader is Rodrigo Ray Rosa. Rodrigo was born in Guatemala in 1958. He immigrated to New York in 1980, and in 1982, he moved to Morocco. American expatriate writer Paul Bowles, with whom Ray Rosa had been corresponding, translated his first three books into English. Ray Rosa has based many of his writings and stories on legends and myths indigenous to Latin America and North Africa. Of his many works, seven have been translated into English, The Beggar's Knife, Dust on Her Tongue, The Pelkari Project, The Good Cripple, The African Shore, Severina, and now Chaos, A Fable. He currently lives in Guatemala City. Please welcome to the stage Mohammed Hanif for his reading. Okay, hi, thank you, Matt. Thank you all for coming. Uh, it's a lovely day out there. Not that you had many choices to. Uh, I'm going to read from chapter two, which is uh, mm, uh, uh, this is one of my narrators. His name is Momo. He's a he's a 15 year old growing up uh, in a refugee camp. <clears throat> and uh, most of his sort of knowledge of this world comes from uh, watching bits of American television uh, occasionally. And uh, so he's picked up this accent that I can't do, but I'm sure you guys can uh, imagine. Uh, this place is full of thieves. I know what you're going to say. You're going to say, what's there to steal? And I'm going to tell you, Look with care. There's nothing to steal because everything has already been stolen. You're going to think maybe you can have a camp without water taps, a camp with road tax, a camp without a road, a camp with electric poles, a camp without electricity. But surely you can't have a camp without a boundary wall. So where is the boundary wall, you're going to ask? Stolen. You're going to say, how can anyone steal an entire boundary wall. And I'm going to say, you don't know these people, my people. When it comes to stealing, they are artists. They stole it brick by brick. Foundations were dug up and every single bit of concrete mortar was taken away. Steel wires were pulled with bare hands. There are those who are going to blame me for prying the first brick loose. But I did that to keep an eye on the comings and goings of the international aid types, nice smelling do-gooders who obviously were the biggest thieves of them all. But they did their paperwork. You see that crater there? That was going to be a dam for a water reservoir. You see that pile of shining steel poles tied down with chains and locks? That was going to be electricity. You see that shack with two buffaloes in it? That's my alma mater. For every wad of cash being pocketed, for every sack of grain or sugar being stolen, there is a pile of paperwork to prove that it's not being stolen. There was a complaints register here where you could report this kind of thing. It had a ball pen tied to it with a piece of nylon string. Yes, you guessed that right. It was stolen along with the ball pen. There was a waterfall here. Yes, a proper waterfall. It had shrunk to three feet, and the fall was only basketball hoop high. Bro Ali and I used to bathe under it when I was a child. And that was not a very long time ago. Some people are going to say that if I was only a child back then, how do I know? How can there be a waterfall in the middle of the desert, they're going to ask. And I'm going to say, you know nothing about this place, my place. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. Our next reader is Tommy Orange. Thank you, Matt. <clears throat> I'm going to read from um, the interlude, which um, a lot of people are calling an essay now. 
um, but I didn't write it that way. It's fine to, be, to call it that. Um, originally, it was part of the prologue. Um, so it's, it is kind of like a nonfiction sounding voice, but just to give you some context. Blood. Blood is messy when it comes out. Inside it runs clean and looks blue in tubes that line our bodies, that split and branch like Earth's river systems. Blood is 90% water, and like water it must move. Blood must flow, never stray or split or clot or divide, lose any essential amount of itself while it distributes evenly through our bodies. But blood is messy when it comes out. It dries, divides, and cracks in the air. Native blood quantum was introduced in 1705 at the Virginia colony. If you were at least half native, you didn't have the same rights as white people. Blood quantum and tribal membership qualifications have since been turned over to individual tribes to decide. In the late 1990s, Saddam Hussein commissioned a Quran to be written in his own blood. Now Muslim leaders aren't sure what to do with it. To have written the Quran in blood was a sin, but to destroy it would also be a sin. The wound that was made when white people came and took all that they took has never healed. An unattended wound gets infected, becomes a new kind of wound, like the history of what actually happened became a new kind of history. All these stories that we haven't been telling all this time, that we haven't been listening to, are just part of what we need to heal, not that we're broken. And don't make the mistake of calling us resilient. To not have been destroyed, to not have given, given up, to have survived is no badge of honor. Or would you call an attempted murder victim resilient? When we go to tell our stories, people think we want it to have gone different. People want to say things like sore losers and move on already, quit playing the blame game. But is it a game? Only those who have lost as much as we have see the particularly nasty slice of smile on someone who thinks they're winning when they say, get over it. This is the thing. If you have the, the option to not think about or even consider history, whether you learned it right or not, or whether it even deserves consideration, that's how you know you're on board the ship that serves hors d'oeuvres and fluffs your pillows, while others are out at sea swimming or drowning or clinging to little inflatable rafts that they have to take turns keeping inflated, people short of breath, who've never even heard of the word hors d'oeuvres or fluff. Then someone from up on the yacht says, it's too bad those people down there are lazy and not as smart and able as we are up here. We who have built these strong, large, stylish boats ourselves. We who float the seven seas like kings. And then someone else on board says something like, but your father gave you this yacht, and these are his servants who brought the hors d'oeuvres. At which point that person gets tossed overboard by a group of hired thugs who'd been hired by the father who owned the yacht, hired for the express purpose of removing any and all agitators on the yacht to keep them from making unnecessary waves or even referencing the father or the yacht itself. Meanwhile, the man thrown overboard begs for his life and the people on the small inflatable rafts can't get to him soon enough or they don't even try and the yacht's speed and weight cause an undertow. Then in whispers, while the agitator gets sucked under the yacht, private agreements are made, precautions are measured out and everyone quietly agrees to keep on quietly agreeing to the implied rule of law and to not think about what just happened. Soon the father who put these things in place is only spoken of in the form of lore, stories told to children at night under the stars, at which point there are suddenly several fathers, noble wise forefathers, and the boat sails on unfettered. If you were fortunate enough to be born into a family whose ancestors directly benefited from genocide and or slavery, maybe you think the more you don't know, the more innocent you can stay, which is a good incentive to not find out, to not look too deep, to walk carefully around the sleeping tiger. Look no further than your last name. Follow it back and you might find your line paved with gold or beset with traps. Thank you. Thank you, Tommy. Uh, our final reader this afternoon is Rodrigo Ray Rosa. Thank you uh, uh, for introducing me, and thank you all for being here. I'm going to read a, a section of, of this um, little novel, which is um, written by one of the protagonists, who is also a writer, and it's called uh, 
an ancient fable. I am traveling through Europe. I will apologize first for my English. I'm, I'm destroying the great work of the translator, but um, I'll do my best not to ruin it completely. I am traveling through Europe with my 12-year-old goddaughter and one of her friends from high school, so I must update my learning. But during an after-dinner conversation of the kind one often has on such trips, I find myself at a loss to explain the difference between human intelligence and what may seem like intelligence in machines. I present two or three arguments that I'm afraid don't manage to convince the girls, who have just read in Paris a text called Identifying Humanoids, a User's Guide a pamphlet for a questionable product called somatic design, accompanied by this note, quotes, this leaflet contains basic information on the interaction of humans with imitation humanoids in 3D, end of quote. A joke, obviously, but it's alarming, most of all because the girls seem to have taken it seriously. A few days later, a likely illustration of a peculiar aspect of human intelligence comes to me in a dream. It was one of those dreams in which the dreamer is a neutral entity, bodiless, a mere spectator. We find ourselves on the Medi Mediterranean coast of Syria in a landscape of white sand, blue, blue sea, and men dressed in black. A group of illegal immigrants is about to board a barge to escape a mob of militia. Are they ISIS? In the group, there are five children without parents. They'd be the last to come aboard. A dilemma arises. There is space for only three of them. A decision needs to be made. Who will be left behind on the beach? If the problem were presented to a machine or to an adult mind, the solution would be simple. Luck or caprice would dictate the outcome. But it so happens that the children, who had become the best of friends on the journey that brought them from a city slum, it might have been Aleppo or Tadmur, all the way to the coast, they are the ones who must solve the problem. At the end of a brief discussion, the children turn up to the captain of the barge to give the only humane response possible. They are not willing to play the game. They will stay together on the beach. The adults are exasperated. The children stick to their decision. The captain gives the order to set sail. As the boat moves out to the sea and the waves grow larger and larger, the children see a cloud of dust rising on the horizon inland. It might be the genocidal militias approaching. The five children at that moment become the secret and privileged guardians of something exclusively ours, the human essence, and which, like a sense of the absolute, can sometimes be communicated through words. In the darkness of the little Parisian hotel, newly awakened from a dream turning into nightmare, I think, the destiny of the adults who set out over the rough sea, though at first sight better than what lies in store for the children, who might be now burying themselves in the sand to hide, is as uncertain as any other human destiny. But the, de but the children's destiny is more certain. The decision they have just made on that Syrian beach, or only in the dream, has made them heroic and thus immortal. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks, all three of you. Can you hear me there? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I wanted to start with uh, kind of a recurring theme I found in all of your works of cyclical violence. And uh, you know, to these eyes, at least, uh, all three of you were very much interested in exploring three sections of that, right? The build-up and tension to the violence, the act of violence itself, uh, and then the aftermath and consequences of that. I wanted to, I wanted to find out more about you know, how conscious of, the, 
of that were you all during the, uh, during the makings of your book? And is, was there a particular phase that you found more vital to stress to your readers uh, while, while putting your story together? Who wants to start? I don't think these are on. Or are, are they? <laughs> I'm glad it's not just mine. <laughs> Um, I think for me, um, you know, I grew up hearing what I thought was for a long time was a massacre narrative from my dad. It's, uh, Southern Cheyenne people are survivors of uh, the St. Louis Massacre. Um, I only came to realize later that it was, it was a, a, a naming story for him. It's how he got his, his Indian name. Um, I think in trying, in knowing that I was going to be write, writing about something cataclysmic and violent and um, not have that be gratuitous, um, I very much wanted to make it clear this, I, this idea of cycles of violence and um, to not just have it be, you know, like an action sequence at the end of the, of the novel. Um, so I start, the, the prologue starts with, with um, it's pretty violent, and it's talking about stuff that actually happened in history, but history is often sterilized. And so to see the violence pop up again in modern day, um, I think it's necessary that you show the cyclical nature of it and where it comes from, um, for it not to risk being gratuitous. Um, so I was always thinking in terms of cycles and sort of echoes of the past and how, how um, contemporary times can echo things that have happened, especially if they've been sort of covered up or or not, um, you know, haven't been talked about truthfully. Well, um, you know, I, I really am not someone who thinks about what he writes. I, I don't have this um, approach to writing. I, I write really mostly from my subconscious. And I think I write about violence because Guatemala happens to be a very, very violent um, country where violence has been, actually, I don't know if there, I think it's more of a stream there, more than a cycle. It's, it's unended. And uh, as so it happens, the year that I started writing, um, there was a explosive event in Guatemala that involved um, an uncle-in-law who was, uh, the, the Spanish embassy was taken hostage by a group of Mayan people from the countryside who wanted to bring to the public attention the massacre they, they were going, uh, I mean, they were suffering, which had not been uh, covered by, by the press. The press refused to actually receive any of this, um, of this commission. They, they, they said, it's too dangerous. we're not going to publish it. So they, they went to five of the only five existing dailies they, and all refused to to tell their story. Then they went to a, um, the, the popular university where they found help, and the idea was to pacifically you know, go into the Spanish embassy and uh, you know, ask to be heard. The response from the government was to surround it and burn everybody inside, including you know, some of the, the diplomats that were there. And my uncle was there by, by bad luck. He, he was called to a, they wanted to bring a commission of, of um, lawmakers to, to Spain to talk about human rights. Anyway, he got burned. I mean, everybody there burned except the ambassador who managed to jump through the window. And then one of the Indian, the Mayan uh, part of the commission who escaped was taken to hospital and then was kidnapped from hospital and executed a few streets away. So that, that's the first thing that I, you know, I started dreaming about this and writing about this. And so for me, violence is at the, at the root of, of, of my desire to write. I, and it's a country that, that um, you won't hear the news because it's, it's not covered, but it's constantly going into very violent, um, a, a repeat of violence. That it, I don't think it, it goes through a cycle because it's, it's a stream, you know, it's, like, it's non, non-stopping. Uh, I uh, work as a uh, journalist, uh, and I've worked as a journalist for so long that people now call me a senior journalist. <laughs> so, and that uh, uh, sort of reporting from Pakistan, I ob- 
obviously end up uh, writing a lot about uh, all kinds of uh, uh, violence. Uh, so when I started writing novels, my dream was that surely, you know, sort of uh, with journalism, you have, you know, sort of a, a duty that you have to, you know, sort of bear witness. You have to write what you're witnessing and you have to go search for the truth. So since this is just me and my, my table and I have no such duties, so I'm sort of creating my own world, so surely I can do better than God and uh, create a really lovely, nice uh, uh, world for myself and for hopefully for my, my readers. Uh, but uh, by the time I get to page 15, something horrible, violent uh, <laughs> happens. Uh, my intentions are always like that, no, I'm not going to uh, let, this, uh, uh, let this happen. So this happened with my first book, which was uh, about the, the, the sort of violent death of a dictator. He died in a plane crash. Plane crashes are inherently violence. There are no peaceful plane crashes. I haven't come across one. Uh, so I had to deal with that. And then I was, uh, mm, I'd lived in London for a long time. And then I'd moved back to, to Karachi. And as a journalist, uh, now we kind of read the papers like you know on our phones or on our things and I would pick up like all the newspapers and uh, and I started noticing um, and sometimes things are quite obvious you know that these things happen but you kind of don't uh, so that you go to your metro page and you open the inner page and you will find a story about a woman who has been murdered uh, in 95% cases by one of the family men members, like husbands or parents or, or the person she didn't want to marry or the person who wanted to marry her. And first I thought maybe I'm just reading too much into this, you know. Uh, but uh, then, um, then I started kind of, you know, for months I would pick up the paper, I would go on the page, like on... As it's, and with as much kind of certainty that you know that on the left hand side there's going to be a, a horoscope and there's going to be a crossword. And you could just look at the other page and there's, and it's always going to be like one and a half inch single column story. And, uh, and sometimes newspapers have uh, holidays, like four or five days a year in Pakistan. So the newspaper don't come out. So I kind of waited for the newspaper to come out. The, day after the holiday. And I just hope that, you know, sort of, uh, if the newspapers can take a day off, the killers would probably, you know, sort of take a day off as well. <laughs> but no, that wasn't the case. Two women had been uh, killed and they were lumped together in, like in the same single column story. So I, I was thinking about, uh, uh, about a nurse and who I kind of, you know, really admired and I wanted to kind of give her like, you know, sort of a beautiful, uh, life, but uh, it did not uh, end well. My third book, uh, this I thought I will be really clever, so I'll start it after a war has ended. So, you know, sort of the violence that has to happen, if it's in inevitable, it has already uh, happened. And, uh, and so, but again, uh, somebody uh, goes missing, which uh, sort of, uh, I, I, I don't know if you guys are aware or not, but of course, you know, you start a lot of wars and a lot of people get killed and, and, and it's all very tragic and sad and brutal. Uh, but sometimes people just disappear, they go missing, uh, which is a, 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 a kind of, uh, uh, which is a corrupt way of saying that uh, they're basically kidnapped by one intelligence agency or the other or one group and the other and they are kept in dungeons and they're tortured and uh, the worst part is that the families, parents or, 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 or families, they don't know for years or years if the person is alive or dead. So that uh, is uh, the kind of uh, violence that we've seen in, in, in parts of uh, Latin America, in, in sort of Indian Kashmir, in, in, in Pakistan now, and many, many other, many other countries. You have a son, he gets killed, you bury him, you kind of mourn over him, you put up his picture, and you know, sort of, uh, you tell yourself that this is uh, 
over now, you know. But uh, then in these cases, for years and years and years, you, you don't know if the person is alive or not, and you cannot give up hope what kind of mother or father or, 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 or lover you are if you just convince yourself that, okay, maybe they're dead. I should stop thinking. So I think that's, the, that's uh, another kind of form of uh, violence. But as I said in the beginning, my intention is always uh, not to write about violence because there is enough of it already like in our lives. And, but yeah, I get sucked into it. Very interesting, all of it. Um, all three of you touched upon you know, kind of the dangers and alert of, of sensationalized violence. Sure, thanks, man. Um, all three of you touched upon kind of the dangers and allure of sensationalized violence. Um, you know, as, as you know, liter literary writers aspiring to write you know, serious, thoughtful books, um, trying to find that line, right, between writing about war and ruin or, or you know, armed violence uh, uh, in a, a forthright and a forthright way done with care, but also not going overboard, right, and, and uh, delving into. Uh, a phrase called like gore porn, gore pornography. Uh, you know, through the crafting, uh, 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 where did you find that line? You know, what did, is, it, is it specifically the language, or is it more environmental than that? Is it is it how the scene's being presented? Is it, is it thematic? Well, um, I think that. It, well, uh, repeating again that I don't think about what I write and what uh, or, or what I have written. I think that. Actually, finding that line may be the immoral thing. It's like if, if it's in your subconscious, it's authorized to be there. And, and if you think of either to protect the reader from this effect or to lure him because of that, that is what I would find questionable. I think, I think um, first that there's no limit to that. I mean, it, 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 and I think sometimes the purpose is pretty, pretty much that to sh you know to show the violence in a way that is not like in the newspapers where you see, you know, someone got married and you don't even think of it. If you describe the, um, the act of violence, um, you bring a th some sort of reflection to it and it, it should shock you more than it does when you read it in a, in a paper when it's, you, you, you're sort of indifferent and you're sort of anesthetized from it. I think some of the writing on violence might have the value of making you look closer and see how how horrible it is and um, become you know sensible as uh, the the opposed of trying to to make it aesthetic. I think that that could be, that I would find that I would not want to do anyway. I think writing is an exercise of freedom. So whatever you do goes. And I think calculating the effect is what might be, I would say, wrong. Mohammed, I mean, you've been a journalist and, and a fiction writer. Do you find when you write about violence, do you write about it differently as a fiction writer? Uh, again, I, I haven't, I, as I said, I kind of try not to write about it and somehow kind of uh, uh, barges into into the story. I try to save myself, my story, uh, from the violence because I, I can't save the real world. I can't save, like, you know, sort of uh, my journalism. So I try, but I, I, I don't really understand, like, how do you calibrate these kind of uh, things in, in a story? I know, uh, I don't know, like, you guys kind of produce great works of art, one of which happens to be Game of Thrones, everybody around the world watches it. And I think, I don't know, uh, last episode, the episode before, people were complaining that there are enough people. How come so many people survive? Like, you know, how, how, come, how come we have so fewer... Uh, deaths? So I think uh, uh, America, through uh, its pop culture and through its... Uh, the other culture of kind of, you know, uh, starting uh, wars around the world whenever, they, uh, whenever they're bored at home, I guess, I don't know. Uh, uh, but, uh, so I think they've kind of raised the expectations. Like, you know, if you have a war in Afghanistan, let's say, it has to go on for 40 years. Like, you can't, like, you know, you want to 
40 episode serial. You can't just have like a seven day war anymore. <laughs> or if you invade Iraq, you want to make sure that the neighboring countries like get truly screwed for next few generations. <laughs> So I think, uh, and uh, uh, so America has really raised the, the expectations, what people expect in terms of uh, violence. Uh, so I try and uh, not match that, because I know I, I can't. I just don't have the resources. I don't have as many plans. Thank, thank you for your candor. Uh, uh, to, uh, Tommy, you mentioned um, you, know, you wanted to veer clear of writing an action sequence. Uh, how did you find that? Um, you know, what was that process? What did that look like in, in the making of it? Um, well, first of all, I wish I'd never heard the term gore porn. It's such a <laughs> terrible, My gift to you. terrible thing. Um, I think for me, the line has to do with, did it happen to me? I know, I know it's fiction, but you know, this, we pull from our lives. Um, so like I have a character who is afraid of a drive-by happening. Um, so he crawls through his living room to watch TV. Um, and this is, you know, this isn't direct violence, but it's indirect violence. Um, and this is something that I did. My, my older sister was involved with um, gangs and uh, I met these people and I just sort of knew um, that that was a, an actual possibility. Um, so writing something like a detail like that from my own life, um, so the line has to do with, did it happen to me? I don't feel bad writing about it because that was one of my realities. If I'm making it up, like at the end, uh, the cataclysmic ending in my book, I feel like to what end am I using violence? Um, so I think paying attention to the sentence and on the craft level and sort of taking care of it in that way is one thing to make sure I feel like I'm doing it right. And, and to what end, is, I think, is uh, a big thing that guides me um, because you know, like Game of Thrones and many others. Like today I was running um, on the treadmill at the hotel and the TV's just playing and I try not to look at it, but it's very distracting. Um, and there's one of these dumb shows where they watch people from YouTube crash into stuff. And um, it's, it's violent, like you're seeing people get actual injuries. Like I know that they're gonna go to the hospital because of what, what I just saw. And that kind of violence, even though it's silly and they're just, it's just like celebrities laughing at people on YouTube getting horrible accidents. Um, I like couldn't stomach it, and I, I normally don't even mess with the channels or even look at the thing, but I couldn't like uh, I couldn't handle the idea of this person has, would go to the hospital and they have a really embarrassing story that's very public, and just all these layers of sadness having to do with this gratuitous violence that everyone's laughing at. Yeah, to, to what end I think really seems fundamental uh, to this discussion. Uh, Mohammed, you, you know, uh, you mentioned you know, wars lasting 30, 40 years now, being very generational. You know. Here in the States, I think it's very easy to get kind of caught up in the idea that um, uh, foreign war, an endless foreign war is something new to, to our, our culture and society, um, though your three works make it very clear that it's uh, uh, that endless foreign war, and specifically endless American foreign war, is, is nothing new, that this is something that marginalized uh, communities uh, both across the world and with our, within our own country have been dealing with the, uh, the ramifications of, of American rot violence uh, for decades and decades, if not longer already. Mm -hmm. Is this something that you, you, know, you feel almost a duty, an obligation to, to bring to the, your readers as a writer, or is it just kind of, it's just there in the storytelling? It's just inherent, and you, you don't even have to uh, think about it because it's just so fundamental to, to what you're trying to tell. I, I don't know, I, I actually never uh, thought about that. As I said earlier, like as a journalist, as a working journalist, I think that there's certain things which is kind of my duty to kind of report and be a witness. Uh, do Americans kind of think that it's their duty to wage these wars or is it just that they also just need another job like everybody else? It's, I, I think it depends on the person. Mm, yeah, so I... Mm, I think more than wars, we've always had uh, wars, but now the world is full of nice people like yourselves, people who write novels, people kind of, you know, who, who donate to pen people, uh, uh, you know, care about, we, we care more probably than people cared about like, you know, 200 uh, uh, years ago. So what I find uh, mm, 
curious about uh, our world is that we can just uh, finish this session, go home and turn on like any of the international TV channels and watch a live war with uh, like, you know, with our dinner at, uh, and that's, and that's like an ongoing uh, thing. So I think I'm kind of more curious that what's happened to us because somehow we managed to convince ourselves that actually we don't really have anything to do with it. Like that we are, we kind of very good at uh, absolving uh, ourselves. That we are, uh, you know, sort of that we, we are peace loving, tax paying kind of, you know, uh, charity funding people. We, how, so, so I don't know. I think I, I'm kind of curious about idea that how complicit we are uh, in these uh, uh, these conflicts is there kind of do we even give it enough uh, time that you know sort of is there something that i can uh, or me or my friends or, or or kind of you know if i am at a university is can my organization do anything uh, about it so i'm curious uh, about that that how we absolve ourselves as i haven't studied all the american uh, wars, uh, you know, sort of, uh, because A, there are too many of them. And B, uh, uh, they, but I have, uh, uh, I have watched the movies, you know, as you, uh, uh, and uh, I think, uh, I don't know if America has gotten better or worse at fighting its wars, uh, but I think what it has perfected is uh, this art of uh, whining, like that you go, you destroy a country, a civilization, and then you come home, and then you whine about it, that you are really... And I, I completely agree that the, the war traumatizes like both sides, like the oppressor and the oppressed. Like you can't come out of it unscathed. But the level of uh, whining is like quite at a grand scale, like a million people dying and somebody kind of getting PTDS. So it's horrible, like, you know. Uh, so I think there should be, we should be kind of looking at, you know, sort of that there should be some, some, some recalibration of, uh, of our, our traumas. And what we get to see is uh, the ways these wars are represented. The way we get to see is like the, the American uh, trauma. And I have uh, sympathy for it, but I kind of want to sometimes stop. But uh, <laughs> like, you know, we just killed like a couple of million people there. You bring up something that I, I think is uh, that I felt for the first time um, in a big way in regards to complicity this year, um, because the violence that we're talking about is o overt and sort of, you know, it's graphic. But the violence of being complicit and paying your taxes, especially if you're paying a, a decent amount, um, is contributing to directly to the suffering of people in other countries, and our military budget is outrageous. So, like, that's violence, paying your taxes to support that big of a military budget that's at the expense of people's lives is violence, too. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, interesting, I mean, you know, as a, as a military veteran, sometimes I, it's, it's interesting to have that discussion with citizens when I remind them that they paid their taxes and, and they were part of, part of this in a, in, in a different, in a very different way. And that's something that um, makes a lot of people uncomfortable. And I think it's good to make people uncomfortable about that kind of stuff. Uh, somewhat related, uh, uh, Henry James had, had a very pithy quote uh, about uh, a lot of history has to happen to produce a little bit of literature. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a great one-liner and, and you can probably poke holes in it, but I, I do think it gets at something that I felt in all three of your works, mm -hmm. which is just kind of that immense sense of history that you're uh, trying to grapple with mm -hmm. and, while, and while also telling an engaging fictional story through. Um, how much of that history, were you ever burdened by that history? Trying, trying to shape it in, into one book? Uh, and do you remember like one particular moment where you're just like, you know what, I'm a, uh, to hell with it, I'm a fiction writer. Uh, I'm gonna break free from history and tell my own story. Well, I think, I think especially the novel is, is um, a form of writing that somehow gets you involved with your, with your present reality, whatever that may be. But history is a different thing. I think history is a, a different way of looking at, at what was there before us. 
and as a fiction writer, I feel like I have, you know, the world starts with me in a way. So I am, I am. It's not that I'm not inter interested in what happened before, but that is history, and and I, I have always felt um, compelled to write about what's first hand, as, as you said, what we know, which could be what we dream of or what nightmares we have. But yeah, I, uh, I love reading history, but I think it's a very different um, field. And I think historical novels, I have a problem with them because I don't think they're really history or novels. So I... I <laughs> um, so that's my relation to, to history. <laughs> What are they if they're not history nor novels? What are they? I'm curious. Answer. Well, they're fiction, but <laughs> <laughs> not novels. Uh, for me, I felt the burden. Um, there wasn't a burden in the telling. The burden was was in the not having heard it, and it not being represented. Um, so when doing research, and you know, generally I knew the way I learned history and the way I've heard it taught, and still is being taught. I knew just generally that's wrong, um, but I never really got into the details, and so I did a lot of research for the prologue specifically of my book, and um, it felt liberating to really like, um, and there's a lot of gruesome stuff to learn, but it felt like the burden was not knowing stuff that I sensed was there, and so the telling of it was, the, it was, it was unburdening, I think. Yeah, I know, I think what, uh Rodrigo just said about uh, these uh, this history and novels that kind of uh, yeah it suddenly this flash went uh, because I my first novel was uh, sort of uh, I thought I was telling like an extended joke but it turned into a historical novel I think that's uh, <laughs> it was a uh, uh, there was a military dictator in Pakistan General Ziaul Haq and his plane crashed and on the plane with him was the U.S. ambassador to Pakistan who was like a rising star in the State Department and one U.S. general and a, a bunch of other Pakistani generals and plane kind of, uh, and as these things usually are, the plane was an American manufactured plane by Lockheed Martin, I think, or what, whatever this is called. And it's supposed to be a very sturdy plane, it's kind of never goes down, it's like been kind of tested in like, you know, 40 wars in the last 40 years, it never goes down. Uh, and it just went down. So as a journalist, I was very curious that, uh, you know, it's obviously sabotage, somebody kind of bombed this plane. But then what I made me more curious was that nobody was interested. Like the American US government, I sitting there, I assumed that they would care about like, you know, losing one of their senior officials. They would want to find out the truth. Or Pakistani army, they lost seven generals. They would be curious, they would want to. Or at least, if nothing, like the manufacturers of the plane, like, you know, and you know that there's something really messed up with the world when even uh, Lockheed Martin stops caring about their own plane. So I was really, I spent with this, like these questions, nagging questions. I tried to investigate as a journalist. I kind of interviewed some people or tried to interview and realized very soon that it was like, there were cover-ups to cover like other cover-ups. There were like too many, like there were too many kind of stakeholders and nobody wanted to find out the truth. So I said, you know, okay, if you can't solve this in journalism as a fact, maybe you can, you know, sort of write a, uh, a novel about it. I think that's the kind of base urge from where a historical novel uh, uh, comes that you say that you'll make up your own uh, truth. But uh, uh, so I wrote the novel and came out. But what has happened is, and why I think you're completely right, because most people who read it in Pakistan read it as a work of history. They think that this must have uh, happened. So sometimes people come to me and ask me, how, how do you know, how, do, how, do you know? <laughs> how did you know all this? Which is, uh, which is a bit scary because, uh, <laughs> because it has lots of weird, bizarre things happening in it and they like, you know, uh, and the people start to believe it. So uh, it's not as harmless a thing as I used to think. Thanks for pointing that out. <laughs> no, I, I, it's not exactly related, but I think um, I was invited to a lunch a few days ago by a, a very old friend at this club in 44th Street. Uh, of Harvard people, actually, very smart. Pretty old, most of them, and a couple of youngsters. 
<laughs> no, there were a couple of new blogs, as they called them, saying that this is the most peaceful time on earth, that why are we talking so much about violence, that, you know, if you look at the numbers, like, really there's more, I mean, less people being killed in wars today, and I'm thinking, am, am I all wrong? I mean, like, did I get it all wrong? But they had Harvard facts, it's like, yes, look, uh, they would, they had them in their memory, but it seemed like they had a log there just to prove that this has been the most peaceful time on earth. And then I started thinking, no, it cannot be true, I mean, and do they count also death by starvation, where there is no need to, you know, all this technological advance? What if they put that into the? I think things would change. And so, and there's, I think there's more of this kind of systemic violence that is not killing people, but but it is letting people die without empathy. Uh, and thinking, well, that's the world, you know, it's, as you were saying, we, we, I do give my charity, I pay my taxes. So what's my problem if people are dying in Mali or in... So I think we're in a very, very violent part of history, but facts will prove me wrong. So that... <laughs> facts, facts, facts. Uh, I think your instinct there that you were being manipulated is, is pretty spot on, right? That they were bending the facts to fit, fit the narrative. You know, Harvard people are big. And they were... And I'm sure they're right, you know, by numbers, but I think there's something very wrong at that way of looking Sure, well, sure, sure. Yeah, it's not including. I was feeling starting to get violent. <laughs> <laughs> As a uh, maybe a, a brief respite from from this dark and heavy talk, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about humor because all three of you employ uh, in very diff radically different ways, actually, uh, both uh, circumstantial and observational humor. And uh, you know, is is that just something? Uh, it's just very human, right? As your characters are, are navigating their ways around um, uh, these, these circumstances and situations that are, that are too big for them, particularly with your younger characters. Um, I'm thinking of Tommy's uh, younger characters particularly. Uh, is that something, uh, uh, Mohammed, is it just kind of natural to you to, to be injecting jokes and, and observational humor in, in, into your stories? Uh, um, well, I didn't um, think of my novel as funny until people said that. <laughs> um, I think I was trying to write characters that feel true to the community that I know and, and to the experiences that I've had. Um, I think sometimes in communities that are, who are oppressed and have experienced collective trauma, I think um, humor is often employed to break tension and to bring what, you know, what humor is good for. It, and it releases something, it, re it releases energy. And so if it happened, I mean, I'm, I'm happy that people think that, um, but I think it's true in the community that people use humor, um, I think unconsciously, to, to release tension. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I, um, I think humor is also, um, you know, a, a device of self-defense, like to, to live through, but as, again, it's something that I don't deliberately do in in the in my writing. Sometimes there are comical situations, and I don't steer away from them. But I'm not thinking, okay, let's inject here some humor too. But certainly in life, I think um, you know I've had occasion to work with journalists who are, have to go to these very dangerous situations to cover, um, and they are the funniest. And the funniest jokes come in this situation. It's amazing how much laughter goes into these really dangerous moments. And I think it's a, it's a way to, to feel um, detached from the danger and, and sometimes, the, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I don't. Uh, I think uh, I'm sort of, uh, I think Rodrigo is right. It's a, probably a way of, uh, uh, a mechanism of self-defense that I don't really want to tell you how I'm feeling at this moment. So I'll tell you a bad old joke type of uh, situation. I think that's how sometimes it uh, uh, it works. But I, I I've never really actually uh, uh, thought about it. It I think probably comes from like you know sort of the way you uh, the way people talk about stuff. So uh, in Pakistan and I'm sure in other societies as well. Like, you know, people sitting in a street corner will be giving, like, a very profound kind of analysis of, of like, you know, religion and politics and, and, and economy. And it's usually kind of is summed up in a, 
in a joke or or in a in a, in a little funny uh, story. So I think the inspiration comes from there, but I don't really know how. Or or I think people have personality. Some people are very funny. They're great storytellers. Like you know, we meet them for dinner and they'll kind of take over the conversation. And then there's a person who, if you tell something, they will go home. And then they will kind of think, oh, I should have said that. So I think some, yeah. So I think I have that kind of thing. Some people are like stand-up comics. They kind of spin in jokes. And then there is like the variety who like sit-down comics. Like, you know, you sit in a corner <laughs> and think of a joke. It is quite sad. So one shouldn't talk about <laughs> uh, This is going to be my final question. Uh, and then I'll turn it over to you all uh, uh, to, see, uh, to hear what you all uh, wanted to ask these these authors. I just wanted to hear more about your inspirations, books or authors that you turn to um, to find the art of violence as opposed to something else and, or something worse or something more grotesque. Um, people that you wanted to emulate that when you were walking these lines uh, you found uh, inspired by or, or maybe repulsed by. Sometimes our best teachers are, are people uh, we learn, uh, we, we want to rebel against. I mean, I, I've never really, I mean, what kind of person will go out to get inspired about violence? I mean, I've never looked at it this way. But I think Bible is pretty good. Like, you, know, you can pick it up. And, <laughs> hmm? um, me and Rodrigo were on uh, WNYC recently. And uh, I just want to publicly redact something I said about Bologna. Um, what he does in 2666 is really amazing. And he has an unflinching view into oblivion. And that's kind of the point. And, um, and it's these missing women um, and very violent, um, by very violent means. And in, indigenous, um, in the indigenous community in, in America, in North America, um, we have the same missing indigenous women thing happening so he's to what end comes back like he's doing it to make a point and he sort of has a statement in the book about like the secret the secret history of the world is in these is in this and uh, I, I don't know quite what he means yet um, but uh, you know he's somebody that I that I definitely looked to um, I, I don't know that I was going to him I just love Bologna and and I think I was able to learn a lot from him I, I think when, when one is starting to write, um, the influences are, are very, well, one knows what was, what has prompted one to write, but by this time, I think the influences that work more are the ones that one has forgotten, that come back as something that you, you, you read 50 years ago and you don't remember and, and you think it's your own idea, but those are influences are... <laughs> You don't, you I, but don't. I, actually, I welcome all influences. I, I mean, I wish I was as influenceable as I was when I was 20. I'm just, um, I has, my plasticity has. <laughs> you can give yourself credit. You thought of it. You can't, you know, if you, it's, it's, it's okay that, uh, you know, you're taking something. No, but that's a, a fact of our brain. We're, we are less plastic and we receive less influence and we can do less with that. I mean, it was really what formed us. And, but anyway, as I... Actually, I steer a wave of inspiration or, or of models when I'm writing because if I find something very close to my idea, it's like now I can't use it because it's not mine. <laughs> so I prefer like, not to think of, actually I don't read any fiction when I'm writing fiction because of that fear that something will influence me to the point of copying or going so far away from it that uh, I have to think of something completely new. Uh, thank you all so much. This has been really just a, a really in-depth, thorough conversation. Thank you. There's uh, two mics, one in each corner. Uh, first question is always the hardest, so uh, some brave soul, please lead the way. Hi. Um, what? All right. Um, I think I was just, because you all write about your cultures and your home countries, is there some part of you that resents the fact that you come to festivals like this, the panel that you get put into is one that has the title over it, Violence? You want us to attack the panel that we're on? 
No, no. But... <laughs> I'm not going to. It, it does get a little tiring because if you come from Central America, they usually, when they invite you somewhere else, they want you to talk about violence. And it's like... <laughs> But I, now I'm resigned to this fate, and it's... <laughs> it's I mean, in I, good I, company, it's okay. I, it depends I, I, on who I, you're I, with. I really, I really sympathize with the festival organizers all over the world. <laughs> I mean, sometimes to amuse myself, I just look at the titles of the sessions. It is, you should try it too, it's like really entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, you know, with, with violence, for me, it was, a, it was more of an afterthought. Like, I wrote the thing because it felt true to, to experience in the, in the history of my people. Um, but I wasn't thinking, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write something violent. It's, you know, it, it happened first as a, an impulse and, a, and the idea, and then we can talk about it afterward. But um, So I'm okay with it as a concept to talk about. In writing these kinds of stories, oh, sorry. In writing these kinds of stories, um, what do you hope to gain? Uh, what do you hope your readers will gain from your books or take away from your books? What the readers will take away from your book? Okay. Well, I, I can take somebody if you want. <laughs> <laughs> do, do, do you want to? <laughs> well, you know, that's a big, big question because one never knows what, what one is giving to the reader. I, I think that mostly the reader takes, there's a lot of the reader in the reading. So that is probably the biggest mystery for me, what people read into this. Um, I usually don't have a public in mind, I usually am writing to someone, a friend usually, or a girlfriend, or someone that, that I think will understand it. And I try, I'm as careful as I can to, to make sure that what you know, is traveling from my brain to the page will go from the page to the other brain, but that, that's a big, big enigma. I mean, I, I yeah, uh, I think that reading is like a, a very, very intimate uh, act, and so is kind of writing. You do it like in, in complete solitude. And you know two people kind of, you know, you can watch the Netflix thing together, but no two people kind of read a book at the same time. And they might be kind of reading like, you know, one after the other, they might be discussing it, or they might be in, uh, in, the, in, the, in a book group. But when they're actually reading it, they are by themselves and just uh, with the book. So, and I, I, in my little experience, no two people read the same book like the same way, everybody's reading a, a different book. Uh, so it's, uh, it's like one of those uh, joyous mysteries of, uh, of uh, publishing a book that, you know, you have no idea what people are going to make of it. I think for me, um, it might be what I don't want the reader to take away, because um, it depends on what reader you're talking about. For, for the native audience, the reaction has been kind of a joyous one. Um, and my book is, is not a joyous book necessarily, um, but there's sort of been a white response that's been like, why is it so sad? And uh, I don't want them to go away with that. Um, or like sort of, why did you do that to me? Kind of thing. And um, you know, it depends on what you're bringing. Like Rodrigo said, um, different readers bring different experiences. So I certainly didn't write something that um, I want to depress people. So I don't want the reader to, that to happen to the reader. So y'all, there's been a discussion about like different kinds of violence, um, structural violence, you know, interpersonal violence. And I'm kind of curious if y'all have thoughts about within the realm of fiction, should these be treated differently or what's your approach? Yeah, I think, I think sometimes it's easy to judge the graphic kind and not look at uh, the structural kind and the, and the kind that is insidious. So I kind of feel like sometimes people go after the graphic kind. And sure, when it's gratuitous, it's obvious. You kind of know that somebody's doing it to, to no end or just for the, the sort of spectacle of it. Um, but I think we should be going after structural and insidious violence in similar ways if, if we're going to be critiquing 
then it should be all in the same plane. What would you say are some examples in your works of, you know, we've talked maybe mostly on direct violence, or some examples in your work that of systemic or institutional uh, violence that you wanted to bring forth to the reader? Um, so like the Indian head is in the prologue, that's the theme. So um, people try to argue to keep like the Redskins logo, right? Um, and they'll, they'll bring up that like they grew up watching with their dad every Sunday on TV and their sort of emotional response to changing something they're used to. But no other, there's no other type of human on a jersey. It's only Indians, and then it's all animals. So what you're doing there is de dehumanizing a certain people, and it's a head, and, and there's a history of human heads and decapitation in, uh, in American history having to do with native people, and there was a, an Indian head at Plymouth Colony put on a spike for display to show like we dominated for like 35 years, I think it was there. Um, that's direct violence, but, but using the Indian head as mascots is a kind of violence, and, and we're not even willing to let go of it still. So my favorite genre is horror, um, and I'm curious about what your thoughts are with regards to the use of a genre like horror, um, which I think, at least my impulse for coming to this panel is uh, the same impulse that makes me love the horror genre. So the same thing that would bring me to one of your books is the same thing that brings me to horror. Um, and just as a reader, I'm curious what your thoughts are about the genre of horror and what uses or differences there are between both uh, differences and similarities and uses. So. <laughs> Mohammed, I think you're up. <laughs> No, I'm, I'm afraid I really, I just know like Stephen King. I might have read two books in my life. So I'm quite illiterate when it comes to uh, this genre. I kind of admire whatever little I've read, but I haven't kind of sat down to kind of uh, mm, mm, like, you know, deconstruct it or, so I'm, I'm really not the person to. I will say, take the same exception. <laughs> But I am a fan. I think Stephen King is a very good writer, very effective writer. I, I have enjoyed his. But I don't. Yeah. As I again, I don't think of these things in, in that term, like analytical. Uh, so I, I really don't have anything to. I must confess, I have enjoyed Stephen King's. I read a little more than two books, <laughs> and I, I have admiration for for the. He has a ter terrible. I mean, a, a terrific. Talent. <laughs> um, I don't know if I'm going to be directly answering. I, I'm also not really a horror um, reader. But I have noticed something that is interesting to me. It has more to do with horror movies. And I've noticed that people of color tend to have a, a liking for horror movies. Um, I've just noticed it just from experience. Um, and I think there's a certain release of tension um, that, that happens with getting scared, like it brings up these intense emotions and you sort of are able to exercise them through this, um, f this fear thing. Uh, so I think the fear quality, it, it can serve as that function. I don't know about the sort of, like the Saw series and the graphic violence in, in that. It's, doing, it's going a little far to get the fear and feels a little more like spectacle. So when it, where it gets gruesome for no seeming reason, um, I'm a little more critical of it, but I understand the sort of wanting to get scared thing. Reminds me a bit of what you said earlier about to what end, right? Is it, is it just being a, a horror uh, blood show for the sake of it, or is it trying to convey something else? I'm glad you didn't say gore porn. Yeah. <laughs> You're shaking me out of it. Hi, um, um, this is probably a question for Rodrigo and Mohammed. Um, as a writer who left my homeland as a result of violence, although a very different type of violence, I'm wondering, has your perspective changed from writing outside of your country to going home and then writing about it again? Well, yes. Um, 
I started writing the same year I left Guatemala, and uh, writing from the distance was, um, of course, safer. I mean, there were many things I wouldn't have probably have uh, dared to write being in Guatemala. One of the good things about Guatemala is that people don't read, so I realized it was no, <laughs> no danger coming from there. And I've, I, I've been back for over 15 years, and um, I'm, more cu I know I'm more curious about finding this, uh, how the system has allowed for this violence to, to be a stream. It's not as, uh, there we don't have, a, there's been no respite. I, I'm, and we are a very violent society. I mean, like you, you, kids grow in these environments where, oh, it's, I, mean, I could tell you many stories, but going back, I, I do think I had my, somehow my vision changed. I'm more interested in, in, in going deeper into this. And really, for a writer of, of novels, there's no danger. I realize that's something I learned, because when you're 20, you think, okay, if I'm going to say this, they're going to come back, I mean, to come after me and, and keep, no, they don't. It's a, they know no one reads, so they don't worry. It's not going to hurt them that you say anything. Even the press has quite a bit. So going back, yeah, I, have, I think I have a, a more um, uh, interest in, in the, on the systemic part, you know, to learn how, how, how is it that this country has this incredibly violent history and contemporary history as well. So yeah, I think one comes with fresher eyes, and I think also one is able to see more, and, and to see also the complicity of a system that, that sort of produces this violent environment. I, um, I wrote my first novel when I was uh, living abroad, and uh, my last two novels were written in Pakistan. I mean, they were all equally difficult to write. I mean, I didn't, I mean, didn't like help, but if it was London or Karachi, uh, I found the process uh, equally uh, painful. Uh, as a journalist, uh, mm, yes, you have those kind of dangers and fears, and, and, and uh, uh, with novels, as you said, nobody reads them. And if people read, they somehow think that it's their national duty to say nice things about it. Because, they, well, because basically nice they think the, the novel, is, <laughs> novel is a harmless little thing. What can it do? Like, you know, so <laughs> what has is, what is a novel ever kind of, you know, destroyed a nation? So, so I, I mean, I'm sure there must be like a difference, like that distance being like in a different landscape. Uh, but I don't know what it is. What somehow helps is, uh, especially with journalism, that I can be in Karachi, but I can pretend to people that I'm actually <laughs> in London. <laughs> that uh, that I've, I've done because somebody, some editor calls up to kind of, you know, find out and say, oh, I'm actually not in Karachi. So. <laughs> <laughs> any, any final questions? Uh, any final questions? Uh, could you say a little more about what you found painful? about writing your novels? And maybe for the others too, if you, if you talk about, about the writing process a little bit. Yeah, sentences, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the question was, what's painful about writing novels? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for me, it's, uh, you know, as a self-loathing and self-critical person, to get the sentences that first come out to where you are happy with them um, is an exercise in self-reflection, and that's not fun ever. I think I've developed a back condition from writing. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I must say I enjoy writing. It's, it's, I, sl I write slowly, longhand, and it's, for me it's uh, pleasure. What's well, not so much pleasure is typing, you know, to produce a manuscript, but the act of writing for me is, uh, uh, I like it. I, I just add, like, I hate nothing more than the blank page when, it, when, it's, when it's up here. Uh, it, it, even if it's terrible, a terrible draft, once it's on, on the screen, I, I, I have com enough confidence that I can work, work with it into something uh, perhaps worthwhile. 
but it's uh, what I find most paralyzing, what's m m uh, the most painful is when I've decided to do something, but I, it's still just a blank page. That's, that's deep existential fear, and uh, I wish it upon none of you. <laughs> Last chance. Well, thank you so much uh, for being here. Thank you to our three panelists. This has been fantastic.